it's Adam here for PC Monitors and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the MSI MAG345 CQR. As usual for video, what you see depends on my camera, depends on the processing done by my video editing software, depends on the processing done by YouTube, and ultimately, and very importantly, it depends on the screen that you're actually viewing the video on, so it doesn't accurately represent what you'd see firsthand using the monitor. In the description of the video, you'll find some supporting content alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, they are nice ways of showing your support. So this monitor uses a 34 inch VA panel with a 3440 by 1440, that's 21 by nine ultra wide resolution and support for a 180 hertz refresh rate. It also has a 1000 R curve, which is a steep curve. So when it comes to the curve, it looks like it pinches in, in the middle, but that's a strange optical effect. It isn't something which you'll actually notice by eye when you're using the monitor. It doesn't have that kind of pin cushioning. And when I consider the curve, I'd say it's less misplaced than it is on 16 by nine monitors. Though even after several days using the monitor, or even a few weeks actually, I do still notice it on the desktop. I can see how some people would find it annoying on the desktop because of that. And it's not a uniform curve. It's actually shallower in the center and steeper towards the edges. I find this lack of uniformity can be a little bit annoying when I'm playing certain games where I'm scanning my eyes from the center to the edges of the screen a lot. So I'm not personally a huge fan of this curve, although I do think it works better on ultra wides like this than it would on a 16 by nine monitor. I also think it's less annoying. And for some games and when I'm watching movies, I do feel it draws me in a bit and it increases the immersion. It's just a very personal thing overall. Some people will quite like this curve, other people not so much. So the resolution and the aspect ratio, there's a nice article on the website exploring this and how it would apply on the desktop to games and movies. So definitely check that out. It's linked to in the description of the video. I will of course show some gameplay as I usually do in my reviews. So you'll be able to see the monitor in action with the aspect ratio. On the desktop though, you get a good amount of desktop real estate. And as you'd imagine, it's mainly the width that you get, decent amount vertically, but of course there's, there's mainly a horizontal bias with this. So it's quite nice for multitasking if you like to do that. And for video editing, it's nice to have this amount of horizontal real estate on the screen, it's stretched out all across the screen. Having your timeline, that kind of thing could be quite useful. And you get a decent amount of text clarity as well because of the pixel density and a good amount of overall sharpness and detail to suitably high resolution image content. Focusing in now on the resolution supported by the monitor and things associated with that. So this is using DisplayPort. You can get up to 180 Hertz at the native resolution and that's with eight bits per channel. You can also have HDR at the same time as this, VRR as well, if you wish. So you can use technologies such as AMD FreeSync and NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. If you want to select 10 bits per channel, then you'd have to be running the monitor at 144 Hertz or below via DisplayPort, as you can see here. Now there's no specific reason to do this for most users because most content you consume is eight bits per channel and under HDR, GPU side dithering can be used, which works very effectively. It's very similar to the monitor doing the processing, but if you do happen to be editing with 10 bits per channel or you want to know the monitors handling this, then yes, you would have to have 144 Hertz as your maximum refresh rate. Via HDMI, quite interesting actually, for some reason there's 100 Hertz and 50 Hertz selectable, but no 60 Hertz, a bit odd. Don't know why they've done it like that. And again, it's eight bits per channel. And you can use HDR and also VRR if you're using AMD FreeSync, that should work over HDMI, but as an NVIDIA user, or if you aren't using adaptive sync for VRR, for example, you're using a PS5, then you can't use VRR. This is HDMI 2.0, so there's no HDMI 2.1 VRR support, in other words. If you set the monitor to 50 hertz at the native resolution, then you can select 10 bits per channel and also 12 bits per channel. Be aware of what I said before, there's no specific reason to do this for most people, but if you need to or really want to, you can do this, but you're gonna be limited to 50 hertz, which is obviously very limiting in itself. Also via HDMI, for compatibility purposes, there is a 4K UHD downsampling mode, so the monitor can accept a 4K UHD signal at up to 60 hertz. So this is useful for games consoles, for example. Turning attention now to the scaling of the monitor, and this will give you also a quick visual demonstration of the kind of real estate, the field of view advantages you can get with 21 by nine versus 16 by nine. So this is the native resolution, and this is with 25, 60 by 1440, 
1440p QHD resolution selected, default scaling behavior of the monitor. The monitor supports scaling at up to 144Hz or up to 120Hz by HDMI for this QHD resolution. As a PC user, you can use GPU scaling at higher refresh rates, but for the QHD resolution, there's no interpolation going on. It's just really giving you these black bars at the side for the unused horizontal pixels. Everything's the same vertically anyway in terms of the pixels. If you go to image, screen size, then there are a few different options. This is with the auto setting, so auto should really look at the resolution and try and fill up as much of the screen without distortion. But you can enforce various different aspect ratios. So there's a four by three setting, 16 by nine, which for the QHD resolution matches anyway, so it's the same as auto. 21 by nine, which stretches to fit the whole screen so things are distorted and stretched and look odd. But if you want to use the entire screen, that's what you could use. And there's one to one, which for this resolution is exactly the same as auto or 16 by nine, but it wouldn't be for the full HD resolution, which I will also be considering. So I'm running full HD 1920 by 1080 or 1080p, and I'm using the auto setting. So you've got the black borders again, it's filling up the same amount of screen as the QHD resolution did, but there's a moderately soft look to the image. You won't be able to see this in the video as you'd see it to the eye, but I will tell you that it is moderately soft. And again, it supports this at up to 144 Hertz, by the way. I know it says 2560 by 1440 there, but it is actually the full HD resolution that's being run here, as you can see in the game settings. I find the moderately soft look can be improved by upping the sharpness to one. Now, I'm not saying that this is the same as you'd see on a 27 inch full HD monitor, but I do think it gives a little bit of an edge compared to the moderately soft look you get before. If you go beyond one, then in my opinion, it over sharpens too much. So it's a balancing act. It's a personal preference, really. And speaking of personal preferences, you may prefer one of the other screen size options. So one to one in this case does actually do something differently to 16 by nine or auto, or it should. Of course, you can see that isn't one to one because the monitor seems to think it's 2560 by 1440, even though it's full HD. I've selected 120 Hertz and it does say 1920 by 1080. If I select one to one now, it does actually work correctly. So for the full scaling capabilities of the monitor, it seems that you need to be running at 120 Hertz at the full HD resolution or below. Anyway, this one to one image, which you could achieve with GPU scaling as well, it just gives you a large black border and it's 1920 by 1080 pixels without any distortion or interpolation used. So add here that there is a setting called image enhancement, which is an alternative sharpness filter to using the sharpness control. And if you increase that one level to weak, I find it's pretty similar, if not slightly stronger than just increasing sharpness to one. But you can combine these settings according to your own preferences. So you get good flexibility. And I'd say overall, the monitor does provide good handling of non-native resolutions. I'm now going to talk about static interlace patterns. So this is where some shades break up into faint horizontal lines of a slightly darker and lighter shade variant. It appears with some greys, blues and oranges most clearly, and it becomes more noticeable as the refresh rate increases. It becomes fairly obvious, though not extreme, by 165 hertz. It's less obvious at 120 hertz and certainly 60 hertz. It's not something most will find bothersome or necessarily notice at all. You can see a quick comparison here of a blue shade in this wallpaper, as it would appear at 60 hertz versus 180 hertz. Now this is actually a different monitor, a different VA model, which I captured this image on, but it's exhibited in exactly the same way on this model. But basically at 60 hertz, you can see a dotted effect. You don't actually notice that to the eye. It appears nicely blended. And at 180 hertz, you can see alternating horizontal bands. And you do notice this by eye as an interlacing pattern. You also have to consider dynamic interlace pattern artifacts. In this case, it's where shades appear to break up into a very fine polygonal mesh during movement, or if you move your eyes across the screen in a certain way. I couldn't capture it on camera, I'm afraid, but it occurs regardless of refresh rate or VRR status. But even at its worst, which tends to be at lower refresh rates, it's quite faint and it's not something most people will notice. I'm now going to talk about the external features of the monitor. So from the front, the stand has a nice solid feel to it actually. It has some coated metal, which I always like to see for a bit of a premium feel to it. It has that at the back of the stand as well, although the sides and the front elements are actually a satin finished plastic, although it's weighted, the stand. So it does have quite a good solid feel to the stand overall. The screen itself, a little bit wobbly when you're using the OSD, 
But overall, I'd say pretty decent build quality for a budget offering. Bottom bezel there, matte black plastic. Top and side bezels, they have a dual stage design, so there's a slim panel border flush with the rest of the screen. Difficult to see when the screen is switched off as it is now, but when it's switched on as it is elsewhere in the video, you can see that panel border surrounding the image. And then there's a slim hard plastic outer component. There's a 1000R steep curve to the screen, which was explored earlier. And there is what I would classify as a light matte anti-glare screen surface. This is more towards a sort of medium to light end than it is to the very light end. This is my own classification system. And what I mean by this is that there is a fair degree of diffusion of ambient light on the screen. You don't get too many sharper reflections, even with reasonably bright light in the room. Although if there's bright enough light striking the screen surface directly, then the glare patches can take on a bit of a sharper look. But also because of the curve of the screen, the glare tends to stretch out across the screen. And if you're viewing the screen off angle, it can really haze up the image a lot. You can see, depending on the angle, sharper glare patches and they kind of stretch out in a weird way. So it can lead to some slightly unpredictable glare patches from different angles. And from a normal viewing position, you can see some glare which is stretched out right across the screen as well. So overall, good glare handling, but do be aware of the curve of the screen which does stretch glare across the screen. The screen offers reasonable ergonomic flexibility. You can tilt it, you can swivel it left and right, and you can also adjust the height. This is with it at the minimum height, by the way. That's its maximum height. You only get 100 millimeters of height adjustment, which is 3.94 inches. So not too generous, but should be okay for most people. Unless you're particularly tall or just depending on your desk, then you might want to consider alternative mounting. Just as a general point as well, the adjustments themselves, they're pretty smooth. Certainly the swivel and tilt is, the height is a touch grabby, but it's not too bad. At the rear of the screen, it is a mixture of textured or matte black plastic with different textures. So you've got sort of a plain texture there, a brushed texture there, and there's some glossy black elements there. Not really a fan of the glossy black plastic, but it's at the back. I don't really care too much. Don't really see it. There are some mystic lights, I believe they're called, RGB LED lighting feature towards the top. You can't see them at all, or really very little from the front. They don't really do anything. They're quite gimmicky in my opinion. You can see them from the back if you can never see the back of your monitor. Brushed metal element at the back of the stand. The rest is a satin finish silver plastic. Also brushed metal there, like I mentioned, for the feet. Speaking of those feet, each foot is individually attached using a screw to the stand, which means the assembly and disassembly time is a little bit longer than it could be. Usually there's a thumb screw and just a single piece for a monitor stand base to attach to the stand neck. In this case, you've got two screws and you need to screw them in with a screwdriver. The stand attaches centrally with a quick release mechanism, so you push that catch up and that will reveal provision for 100 by 100 millimeter visa mounting. There's a case slot over there, Kensington lock slot. And the ports, there aren't exactly a huge range of ports here. They face downwards. You've got two HDMI 2.0 ports, display port 1.4, a 3.5mm headphone jack, and a DC power input. So the monitor does use an external power brick. We can just about see that with this mess of cables underneath my system. There's sort of a normal size power brick there, but this one is actually for this monitor, sort of a half size one. There's also a little red cable tidy loop here, which Looks like it should be detachable, but it doesn't seem to be. I think I'd probably snap it off if I pulled too hard. Just plastic, red plastic, attached to there for cable management. And just another thing to note, the monitor does not include any integrated speakers. This image here shows the sub-pixel layout of the monitor. It has a standard red, green, and blue stripe layout. So this is your default layout. So there are no particular issues with weird split subpixels as some generally older VA models used to have, which can cause text clarity issues. And there aren't any issues with fringing you have to be aware of due to other weird subpixel quirks. So you don't need to run clear type to make corrections, but you may wish to run through the clear type wizard just to adjust according to your own preferences. So overall, I had no concerns with text clarity related to the subpixels on this monitor. I'm now going to take a look at the calibration of the monitor. So there are various different conditions tested here. There are various gamma and white point readings taken using a data color Spider X 
elite color emitter. So you can see that out of the box, the gamma tracks 2.1 on average, so a little bit off the 2.2 target. I will look at this in a little bit more detail very shortly. The white point sits at 6804K, so it's a bit cooler than my preferred 6500K target. With Pro Mode sRGB, which is an sRGB emulation setting that clamps the gamut closer to sRGB, it didn't affect the gamma or white point significantly. I also like to explore some low blue light and similar settings just to show the kind of effect they can have. And the low blue light setting, the gamma reduced a bit to 2.0 on average and the white point lowered to 5400K. So this is quite an effective low blue light setting which reduces the blue color channel. So it does achieve what it's supposed to. Setting the color temperature to warm does the same thing. It has a slightly stronger effect but it has a better balance to the image because it doesn't have the green push which I noted with the normal low blue light setting. So I would prefer this for balance personally, but again, it's personal preferences. If you set the color temperature to customization, that puts all of your color channels in their neutral position. That actually got me close to the 6,500K target. But what I would say is that the green channel was actually a bit weak here and actually a bit weak out of the box relative to the red and the blue. So for my test settings, I did make various adjustments to color channels and various other things. You can see that here. There's also a best settings video which covers these settings in a little bit more detail and sort of demonstrates them on the monitor. There's a link to that in the description of the video. There's also a little note at the bottom here just saying that some ICC profiles are provided, again, in the description of the video, although they're not used in this review. Looking at the gamma curve in a bit more detail, you can see the tracking versus the 2.2 curve. This is using my test settings, but it was similar out of the box and also using the sRGB setting. So there's actually quite a bit of deviation in places. Overall, I didn't find this to be particularly problematic and given the main uses for this monitor, not a big issue. Although it's not clear from this graph, there were some issues with darker shades. There was a clear uplift of gamma. So this image here gives an example of some of the problems that that can give. There is noise in the image. You can see those little gray pixels amongst a sea of black or very, very dark shade. Those gray pixels are lighter than they should be. So they brought out these little artifacts and you can see them quite clearly on the monitor and they just don't appear as blended as they should. I can see this on various photos, video content, and if it's streamed content, then it's gonna have compression artifacts. So these little blocks can move around. And even in games, you can just see little unintended details. They are unintended. Things really are just supposed to look more blended and these little sort of imperfections, if you like, they're not supposed to be as obvious as they are on this monitor. And it doesn't have any alternative gamma settings and none of the other presets will make reasonable adjustments to correct this and certainly won't do that kind of thing without upsetting the image elsewhere. So I'm, I'm not really a huge fan of this but I suppose you could argue it has some competitive advantages. I will touch upon this again in the contrast section. Switching the attention now over to the color accuracy of the sRGB mode. It's pretty reasonable overall. So the average Delta E 1.56 with this particular test, this is the Spider Checker 24 test. You can see the outlier there is again, as it usually is, shade 1F Cerulean. Color image is very sensitive to the balance of blue and green. It seems to be that this shade is a pretty delicate one. Monitors are often mess this up. It's often the highest error. But even outside of that, there are some values which are above a delta E of two, which isn't ideal. And you can see some errors above two for grayscale shades as well. And the gamma will affect this quite heavily. But again, the overall accuracy, it's, it's all right. It's not great and it's not terrible. Just for fun, I'll extend this out to the 48 test patches. So there are a greater array of shades and you can see quite a few of these are above two. Again, the average now sits at 1.65, so it's slightly worse. And it just certainly does just generally better with some shades than others. But be aware this is a VA model and I will cover in the color reproduction section that there are some perceived issues to be aware of, color consistency issues, which the color emitter does not account for in any way with these little central readings. Focusing in now on the contrast performance and the brightness capabilities of the monitor, this table here shows various readings taken under SDR, including white and black point readings, plus calculated static contrast ratios. And the readings here, they were taken using an X-Rite i1 Display Pro Plus, which is now marketed as a Calibrite Color Checker Display Plus. So the maximum value recorded here was 372 nits, and that's with Pro Mode sRGB at 100% brightness. Although with 100% brightness and out of the box or with color temperature set to customization, all pretty similar values here. Contrast ratio sits quite close to the specified 3000 to 1, 
a little bit above that most of the time, except with the adjustments I had to make to my test settings, it was a little bit below that at 2783 to 1. So this is really firmly within VA only territory for this kind of static contrast reading, but not as strong as some VA models. And just a final thing to note with relation to this, the monitor uses DC dimming rather than using PWM for brightness regulation, so that means that the monitor can be considered flicker-free as advertised. Of course, that doesn't mean it's free from all forms of flickering. I do explore VRR flickering a bit deeper into the review. I'm on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm going to talk about contrast performance using some in-game examples. So, as a VA model, with a static contrast of around 3000 to 1, you do get better depth and atmosphere to these darker shades compared to what you'd see on an IPS or TN model. Certainly if you're viewing in dimmer lighting environment, as I am right now. It, just gives a, it also just gives a little bit better definition to some of the shadows and some of the darker areas surrounded by medium to brighter shades, and some of the medium shades have a bit more depth to them as well. But it certainly doesn't compare to the experience you'd get on an OLED, which has vastly stronger contrast, certainly if you're viewing in these kind of lighting conditions. You might also notice that there is some glow towards the top and bottom of the screen. There's just a little bit of a slight silvery sheen there. That's what I like to call VA glow. It is not as intense as IPS glow. It doesn't eat away at the detail as much and it doesn't affect as much of the screen. It is something which is quite commonly observed on VA models, especially of this kind of size. It can also be brought out more strongly for using a higher brightness on the monitor, if you are sitting closer to the monitor, or if your unit has particular issues with backlight bleed and clouding. My unit does have a little bit of clouding at the top and bottom of the screen, which does bring out this VA glow a bit more. But this does vary between individual units, this clouding, and it is something which I commonly observe on curved VA models in the same kind of places. But still, I'd say as far as LCDs go, decent overall atmosphere to scenes like this and darker content. Having said that, there are some issues that I mentioned earlier to do with gamma. Now, the good thing is that that means that there isn't really any obvious issue with black crush on this monitor. That's because actually some of these shades are lighter than they should be. And that does actually affect the atmosphere and the sort of intended look isn't really there. So I can see that for this, uh, I don't know if it's a bookcase, the, the thing against the wall there anyway. Some of the shades just are lifted up too much and I can see some unintended detail here and it does lose a bit of atmosphere for that reason. Same with the wall there, but by the same token, I'm not getting black crush, I'm not getting a masking of detail. So you could say that this gives a competitive edge, but this really isn't a monitor designed for competitive gaming as I'll come on to shortly. So I don't really buy that. I personally would have preferred to have seen a gamma control, different gamma settings, things which would give a more masked and natural appearance to things. But, you know, it is what it is. I've brightened the room up. There's nice daylight coming into the room now. And that does certainly take the edge off that VA glow. It's not really noticeable. And actually, I'd say the perceived depth of some of these darker shades has improved and the sort of inaccuracies of the gamma, they're not as noticeable. So in some ways it's actually nicer to use this monitor with a bit of light in the room. If that's not practical for you or you prefer sitting in a dark room, I would consider at least some bias lighting behind the monitor or at least some form of lighting behind the monitor. It can just help with perceived contrast even if you do prefer the rest of your room to be dark. And because it's brighter you do see some glare on the screen. It's again diffused quite nicely across the screen so you don't get sharp glare patches so much but you do get that diffusion which does sort of haze up the image a little bit. That is one of the side effects of matte screen surfaces. This particular matte surface as I mentioned earlier it's what I'd classify as light matte anti-glare. So good glare handling but there is a bit of layering in front of the image and a bit of graininess as well. It's not a strong graininess or obvious coarse smeary graininess or anything like that. But it's really quite typical for a VA model, and it isn't as grainy as some VA models I've seen actually in terms of the screen surface, but it does still have a little bit of graininess. So if you're very sensitive to that, just be aware of it. I am very sensitive to this, but I think for most people, the level of graininess on this particular screen surface is going to be just fine. Moving on to assessing the colour reproduction now, and I like to start off with Legom, Legom.nl, and the tests for viewing angles. I like to talk about colour consistency. So that is the difference between a given shade as it's represented at different points of the screen. So let's say the central versus peripheral points of the screen. And the Legom text, it should ideally appear a blended grey throughout the screen, or at least a blended consistent shade throughout the screen. But here you can see it appears a blended grey centrally, but it appears more colourful with a red tint 
towards the peripheral sections of the screen and it has some orange in places as well. So this indicates moderate viewing angle dependency to the gamma curve of the monitor. Viewing this solid purple shade or what should appear a solid purple shade also always appears odd in the video but to the eye it appears a pinkish purple throughout the screen but it has a stronger pink tint peripherally. Not like it appears on the video where it has this sort of pink cone centrally, it actually appears more pink towards the very edges of the screen. And the pink versus purple hue that shifts with head movement or eye movement as well, quite readily. The red block that appears a reasonably consistent, rich, or slightly pinkish actually red throughout the screen. It's a bit pinker towards the peripheral regions of the screen, but this isn't a dramatic shift, not as dramatic as I've seen on some VA models. Also be aware that the shifts I'm talking about here, they're more pronounced if you sit close to the screen. I tend to sit with my eyes around 70 centimeters, a little bit further back depending on my posture, but sitting closer than that would exaggerate the shifts and further away, provided you're sitting pretty centrally, that can make the shifts less pronounced. The green block that appears a good yellowish green chartreuse throughout the screen, slightly brighter towards the edges, but that's more to do with the dual stage bezel design, it's something I commonly observe even on IPS models. It's not really too obvious in this case anyway. The blue block that appears a good rich royal blue throughout the screen. Battlefield 2042 and I'm going to talk about the colour reproduction using some in-game examples. This monitor is a wide gamut monitor so it has a colour gamut which extends beyond sRGB by a fair amount. When you're using a gamut on the monitor which extends beyond sRGB, when you're viewing most normal content under SDR such as this game or you're just on the desktop, you're watching movie content, it's actually designed with the sRGB colour space in mind because that's the common standard. And that does mean that if your monitor's gamut's wider than that, it can invite extra vibrancy and extra saturation. I recorded 90% DCI-P3, and if you're interested, it's 84% Adobe RGB. So there's quite a bit of extension beyond sRGB, although this isn't an extreme gamut. So for example, the sand here, that appears with a bit of a red push. So a bit more red than it should appear, but this isn't strong as it is on mon monitors which have stronger DCI-P3 coverage, so an even wider gamut, for example. The color consistency does mean that a bit of saturation is lost towards the edges, and actually, if anything, this sand looks a bit more accurate towards the edges of the screen than it does centrally because of that loss of saturation. Difficult to show you on the video, but it is something which I noticed by eye. Green shades as well. They appear with a bit more pop, a bit of a brighter green than intended for the bush here, for example. But it's not too extreme. It's certainly not an extreme push. It doesn't look neon or cartoony. And again, it's more pronounced centrally than it is towards the edge of the screen. Not a dramatic shift. The colour consistency of this model, as far as VA models go, is pretty reasonable. Also a bit of extra pop to the sky blues, although on this particular map it's not actually very obvious. It looks fairly neutral and it's not a strong extra pop either. Monitors which have stronger Adobe RGB coverage tend to have this issue observed in a more obvious way. And you can notice with skin tones, you can't see them in this particular scene, and just earthy browns in general, they do tend to have this slight reddish push to them because of the gamut. Again, not too extreme in this case. If you prefer things to be more toned down, more as the developers intend, you might say, then you might want to use sRGB emulation. So you could set Pro Mode to sRGB. Now things look actually like they've gone too far the other way. If you consider the gamma handling, the colour consistency I've talked about, so losses of saturation peripherally, now there's under saturation there rather than just more appropriate saturation. And you can't edit the colour temperature, so you can't control the colour channels, the red, green and blue channels. You can adjust the brightness, thankfully, but there are no gamma controls or anything like that either. So yeah, if you look at the colour gamut now, it actually covers 92% sRGB, whereas before it was 100% sRGB with quite a bit of extension beyond. So it does clamp the gamut effectively in terms of cutting out the oversaturation, but it actually goes too far, really. So there is some under coverage. And if you think about the color accuracy I was talking about before, some of that can actually be down to the gamut not fully covering sRGB, as well as the somewhat wonky gamma tracking. Also other aspects such as the color channel balance and just how the monitor is representing shades. So if you're using this monitor for color critical work, I would actually recommend using the full native gamut. I wouldn't say 90% DCI-P3 is really good enough for accurate work within that colour space and certainly not 84% Adobe RGB, but I know some people do still like to use a bit of the encroachment 
from a wide gamut monitor onto these IP3, whatever they can get. And it's just personal choice really. But if you think about standards, it's really sRGB, which can be fully covered. But if you're using sRGB emulation mode, 92% sRGB is not exactly ideal. Plus, regardless of what you're doing, even if you calibrate the monitor using your own colorimeter, which I would recommend, that is ideal if you can, then you are still going to be bound by those color consistency restrictions, which I mentioned. As I said, for a VA panel, it's not too bad in this case. I just generally don't recommend VA models for serious color accurate work for this reason. And I would recommend more consistent models such as IPS alternatives if you're particularly interested in color accuracy. You also have to be aware of the color consistency. It's because of some slight viewing angle weaknesses. And if you go off angle, they become more pronounced and things do wash out quite a bit. From the sides, it happens quite quickly on this monitor actually from the sides, but it's not terrible, not as strong as I've seen on some VA models. And if you go above, then it washes out quite a lot. If, however, you're sitting a bit below the monitor, so let's say you're on a couch or a sofa or something below the monitor, then actually that increases the gamma a bit and things look a little bit deeper overall. I know sometimes people like to have their mates over and whatever, maybe they're looking at the monitor from slightly to the side. That can work okay in this case because the washout isn't too strong. On some VA models, even that would cause extreme washout. So the view angle performance of this one is okay, really, for a VA panel. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I've got the game running under HDR. The monitor does support HDR, very basic HDR10 output from this one, so I'm not going to spend very long on this section. Under HDR, I recorded a brightness of 328 nits with a white point of around 6900K. The monitor's backlight doesn't change, there's no dynamic contrast, there's no local dimming, so there's no need to measure things in any more detail than this. That's a low brightness by HDR standards. It really just means that the backlight is at a pretty similar level to full SDR brightness, and it doesn't change at all. And there are some other issues with this monitor under HDR, not just the fact that it has no local dimming and it has a moderate fixed brightness. It also looks as if the gamma is basically too low. So things looked a bit raised under SDR, as I said, but under HDR, that's even more dramatic. So basically the PQ curve under HDR is completely off. A lot of these shades are brighter than they should be. So I'm not even going to talk about the sort of nuanced shade variety and the 10-bit color reproduction here as advantages under HDR, because really I think this monitor's HDR experience is just too basic and the way it's tuned is just not good enough to really take advantage of that extra color processing. I mean, I suppose some gradients can look a bit smoother in places, such as the bright shades, which I'm going to show you shortly. But think about the dark shades, they're just uplifted far too much and it doesn't have the kind of look it should. And the brightness here doesn't really look impressively bright either. And there just isn't the proper contrast between the bright shades and the dark shades. Diving into the water. Again, I could see even whilst I was diving into the water that a lot of these medium shades are brighter than they should be. They lack appropriate depth. Yeah, some of the gradients are, I suppose, a bit smoother, the weather effects, that kind of thing. So HDR does give a different look to things and gives some questionable advantages. But that the brightness, again, of that glint on the water surface is just not impressive at all and the water itself just looks murky, it doesn't look as it should. It's worth mentioning colour reproduction. I'm just going to again briefly discuss this. So Lara's skin, it does have a bit of a push under SDR where it looks too reddish. Under HDR I think it actually goes too far the other way even when it's displayed centrally. So there isn't any sort of loss of saturation related to viewing angles here. I'm looking at the central region of the screen here. It still, it doesn't look sort of ghostly like it does on the video, but her skin does look less saturated than it should and less rich. And I can see that with the green shades as well. They don't look as rich as I'd expect given the gamut of the monitor. It can be partly due to the brightness regulation and the fact that it's not able to use local dimming to really accentuate the depth of some of these shades, but really the gamut isn't being used to the full extent that it should be here. So the overall look really is just you might describe it as washed out under HDR and even on a monitor which doesn't have local dimming and certainly with a, a gamut this wide it can still be tuned in a way which gives more richness than I can see here.
I'm on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. This is a 180Hz monitor. I've got the game running at a nice solid 180 frames a second. So I'm getting the most out of that refresh rate. And with this, it brings a few advantages. The monitor is able to output up to three times as much visual information every second as a 60Hz monitor, or indeed this monitor running at 60Hz or 60 frames a second. That improves the connected feel, which describes the fluidity and the precision you feel when you interact with the game. This is also something which can be aided by low input lag. In this case, I measured 3.74 milliseconds. This is a low level of input lag. It does indicate a low signal delay, which is the main element of input lag you feel. There's an article on the website which explores responsiveness in more detail. It explores the concept of perceived blur and explains that most of the perceived blur you see on a monitor comes from the movement of your eyes as you track motion on the screen. And that's tightly linked to the refresh rate of the display, assuming that the frame rate is suitably high and ideally matching that. It also comes from the pixel responses of the monitor. And there's a method called Pursuit Photography, which is a nice way of capturing both elements of perceived blur nicely. So here are some Pursuit photographs on this monitor running at 180Hz. And its three different response time settings are also assessed normal, fast and fastest. There's also a reference screen, which is another VA model. The AOC 27G3XMN, and you'll be able to see quite clearly, even if you have the MSI set to its fastest setting, it does not match the reference screen. There is more pronounced smeary trailing behind it, particularly for the dark background, which is the top row. That is reduced slightly as you go up the overdrive settings, but it never gets close to the reference screen, which itself does have some weaknesses here anyway. And you can also see this for the medium background, the light background's better, but it doesn't quite match the reference still. It's not easy to see from these transitions, but there's a little bit of overshoot as well for the faster setting for the light background. But for these particular transitions, it's not really an issue. So let's look at some response time data, some measured response times using the OSRTT Pro tool. The same tool and methodology used by TFT Central, so you can cross compare our values to monitors that they've reviewed. But in general, you do have to be wary about cross comparing. Even with their data, they use their own color coding system, but certainly the numbers can be compared. But if you're comparing to other reviewers, be aware that they'll use their own methodologies and their own equipment. So you can see the initial response times, that's what's measured in the table. So the average initial response time, 11.29 milliseconds. This is with the normal overdrive settings, the lowest overdrive setting. This is really sort of overdrive off experience or really the native solution of the panel with very little added acceleration, if any. So there's a lot of red for the initial response time readings. If you bump up to the fast setting, then it does tone down some of this red. There's a bit of green now, a bit of orange to green, but still quite a bit of red. And the average initial time drops from 11.29 milliseconds to 7.6 milliseconds, which still isn't amazing. There's also a bit of overshoot in places. Nothing too extreme, but still some recorded here. Bumping up now to the fastest setting, that does change things a bit. So the average initial time drops from 7.6 to 5.2 milliseconds. So there's less red now, although there's still some red, and the highest value recorded has actually gone up a little bit to 27.9 milliseconds. That's rather on the slow side. And there's just a lot more overshoot you can see on the table recorded here, a lot more red there. So back to the game now, and considering a broader range of transitions and even measured here, than was, was measured there even, you do definitely see some smeary trailing in places. It's not too bad on this scene because it's mainly light to medium shades, but there are some dark shades mixed in for the wall there. So I can certainly see some weaknesses, extra perceived blur that ideally wouldn't be there. You can see that for the sort of finer details as well, the alternating mixtures of lighter and darker shades. Just a general mask of added perceived blur. And for the white there as well against the darker background, it's definitely what I'd describe as pretty heavy powdery trailing. Not exactly smeary in appearance for these particular transitions, maybe a little bit in places, but not too bad. Now, this was actually all using the fast setting. If I switch over to fastest, you remember that with test UFO it looked okay, but with the recorded values there was definitely some overshoot, and I can see it very clearly here. So around the wall there, for example, bright halo trailing, which is brighter than the sky even, so it stands out to me in a way which I don't like. And even then, when I look at these finer details, like the brickwork there, if you want to call it brickwork, and, and the white there as well again, the weaknesses, they're slightly less distinct, I guess, but there's still an obvious mask of extra perceived blur. 
So you get a combination of a lot of perceived blur in places plus overshoot in places, which I do not find attractive at all. I'm now on a different scene on Battlefield 5, and I'm using my preferred fast setting now. The scene here has a lot of darker shades mixed in, so a lot of high contrast transitions and a lot of transitions which the monitor clearly struggles with. There really is some quite significant smeary trailing here. You should be able to see that in the video even, so if you look at the makeshift roof, even the character up there, the, even the blue blob above it. It's, it's actually so widespread that I don't really need to give specific examples, it's just all over the place, the flags as well. I wouldn't say this is the worst I've seen on a VA model, it isn't, but it definitely is far from the best as well. Using the fastest response time setting now. Cuts down a bit on some of that, but there's still a lot of smeary trailing. The flags there are particularly egregious. <laughs> I mean, you'll be able to see that very clearly in the video. It's quite actually a bit dizzying to look at, to be honest. I'm going to stop that. But there's also overshoots. So there's some dirty trailing around the lamp there and halo trailing around the lamp post, also around the trees. The makeshift roof kind of just has a inky look to the trail, which is actually a mixture of overshoot and conventional weaknesses. It sort of just bleeds out. Same with the flag there and the tree. And the flag post again is showing some halo trailing overshoot, which is quite eye-catching. Difficult to show you in the video, but to my eye, pretty nasty. I prefer the fast setting again. The weaknesses don't always manifest as distinct trailing either behind objects, so there can just be a blending together where the brighter shades blend together into the darker shades during movement. So basically the brighter shades or the medium shades for the bush here, for example, they darken during movement and then when the movement ceases they return to the appropriate shade value. And this can appear as a flickering in places. And you can see this on the desktop as well, so I'm using X Twitter with its dark background, the lights out mode, and you can see the light gray text completely disappear, blend into the black when I scroll. It does depend on the scrolling behavior of the browser. You don't really notice this so much on Chrome, but it can also depend on the animation patterns. And when you're looking at images, you can just see distinct weaknesses, like some sort of smeary trailing in places. And certainly if you're moving windows around, then some more distinct weaknesses can be apparent. So I just wanted to use this as an example just to show you that although I'm, I mainly talk about games, if you're just using the monitor on the desktop, you can still expect some weaknesses in places. It might not be as annoying, but personally I do find them annoying even when I'm just moving my mouse around the screen or if I'm scrolling websites or moving windows around. This monitor does support VRR, variable refresh rate and you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode if you're using DisplayPort or if you're using HDMI or DisplayPort you can use AMD FreeSync. The monitor does not support HDMI 2.1 VRR as it does not have HDMI 2.1 or any of the features of that. So I've got the game running at 120 frames a second. The monitor is running at 120 hertz so it's matching the frame rate with its refresh rate. This keeps tearing and stuttering at bay which you'd get without VRR. That does work certainly. At 120 hertz, the weaknesses are somewhat less apparent, but there's still obvious smeary trailing in places. And there's also a reduction in connected feel compared to the 180 frames a second, 180 hertz experience. But it's still reasonable in that respect, because 120 hertz is still a decent refresh rate. But before you get too sick with all that movement and smeary trailing, let's show you some pursuit photographs. So again, there's a reference screen there performing quite a bit better than this MSI, even though that reference itself does have some weaknesses. You can definitely see weaknesses with the MSI, even with the fastest setting, there's some clear smeary trailing in places. So let's look at some response time data using the normal setting. Again, a lot of red here. Average initial time, 12.61 milliseconds. Not a great 120 hertz experience. Here you can see things bumped up too fast, which certainly does improve things, but the behavior is actually different if you're using VRR versus if you're not. So the top graph there shows static 120 hertz refresh rate, whereas the bottom graph shows 120 hertz achieved using VRR. VRR basically uses 
somewhat stronger acceleration. So the average initial time is 6.66 milliseconds rather than 8.38 milliseconds. Of course, both are improved compared to the 12.61 milliseconds using the normal setting. But you do get some overshoots and there's increased overshoot with VRR, active versus not active. And either way, I mean, there are still some clear weaknesses with the response times, some red on the graph and some orange, some pretty high values here. Using the fastest setting now, things are quite interesting. There's a definite difference between static and VRR now when you're looking at both the overshoot and the response time data. So the average initial time with a static 120 hertz has gone from 8.38 milliseconds to 8.28 milliseconds. Incredible, I know. With VRR, it's gone from 6.66 milliseconds to 4.53 milliseconds which is a more significant decrease. So there's actually the response times, most of them are okay now, although there are some weaknesses still, but really that overshoot is where the problems are recurring here with VRR at 120 hertz. There is a lot of that overshoot. Even if you're not super sensitive to overshoot, this is probably gonna be quite annoying. So just to show you in game, it doesn't actually look, or wouldn't look on the video too different to what I was showing at 180 hertz. There's actually still some distinct weaknesses I'm using the fastest setting. Sorry, I didn't mention that. I'm using the fastest setting here. I'm trying to show you some overshoot. I can definitely see it to my eye. I don't know how it'll appear in the video, though. I've now got the game running at 60 frames a second. The monitor's running at 60 hertz. I'm using my preferred fast setting. Now, the connected field is way worse than it is at those high refresh rates, but the monitor's still doing its thing with VRR to get rid of tearing and stuttering from frame and refresh rate mismatches. The variable refresh rate range of the monitor is claimed to be 48 to 180 hertz, and below that 48 hertz it could use LFC, low frame rate compensation, which sticks to a multiple of the frame rate with the monitor's refresh rate. However, I found that the floor of operation was actually, as I often do, closer to 55 hertz. Sometimes slightly above that, actually, I even found it activating sometimes as high as 57 hertz for some reason, at least with my NVIDIA RTX 3090. But LFC did work, so below that it did stick to a multiple. So let's say the game was running at, I dread to think, 35 frames a second. The monitor can run at 70 hertz to keep tearing and stuttering at bay. But let's look at the response performance at 60 hertz, because I can see to my eye, even at 60 hertz, there are still some distinct weaknesses. Of course, this smoothy trailing in general is more palatable, less noticeable, because the pixel response requirements for a good performance are so much lower now, but it does definitely still have weaknesses in places. And you can pick that up pretty clearly from the Pursuit photographs. And again, the reference screen outperforms the MSI here. There is some improvement going from normal to fast to fastest, but isn't ever as good as a reference screen. Let's quickly look at some response time data. The normal setting, again, lots of red as expected, but no overshoot, 12.13 millisecond average response time. Even for 60 hertz, this isn't a good performance. And now with the fast setting, again, static at the top, VRR at the bottom. So again, with the static 60 hertz, lower levels of acceleration, lots of red, but not much overshoot. So it's lots of red on the response time graph, sorry. And with VRR, less red, still some red, some orange, and more overshoot to contend with. So actually, at 60 hertz and lower refresh rates with VRR active, you might even want to use normal if you find the overshoot too annoying. But remember that your average initial time is going from 12.13 milliseconds to around half of that, 6.03 milliseconds with VRR active at least. So it does actually speed things up quite a bit. So really, there's not a perfect choice here. You might just want to stick to fast throughout the entire VRR range, but you might find the overshoot becomes overbearing and you may prefer to use normal, but then you get much slower response times. So I don't think that any of the settings are incorrect, nor do I think that any of the settings are going to give you a lovely experience. And I'd add as well that I did watch some movie content, some 60 frames a second content is very similar to the 60 hertz experience you get in game. So, you know, some definite weaknesses there. For the lower frame rate content, 24 to 30 frames a second, then the weaknesses are less pronounced, but even then there are still some standout weaknesses where the pixel responses, even for such a low frame rate, just don't really keep up to give an optimal performance. Not too bad, I have to say there, but still not ideal. So it's really mainly for the dark shades or whether they're high contrast situations, whether they're very bright shades against much darker backgrounds. Moving up to the fastest setting now, average initial time drops from 9.72 to 7.88 milliseconds for the static performance, 
and with VRR it goes from 6.03 milliseconds to 4.54 milliseconds. So yes, improvement, but again, that comes at the expense of overshoot. And really, with VRR 60 hertz, the fastest setting gives widespread and strong overshoot. It's, it's really more for the medium shades. So in this graph, it's from 51 to 204 for the RGB values where the overshoot is present. So far, I've considered situations where the frame rate is very stable, but actually when you're playing games, a lot of the time the frame rate will not be that stable, certainly if you haven't set things to potato graphics or you don't have a super powerful GPU or whatever. And unfortunately, this monitor does suffer from VRR flickering, and that is something which is quite common on VA models, so different degrees of VRR flickering. This one suffers from what I describe as a moderate to high level of this, and it really occurs when there's just a sufficient fluctuation in the frame rate. This will definitely occur when you're passing the LFC boundary, but even if you're just fluctuating from, say, 60 to 80 frames a second, you can notice it. If you're fluctuating between, say, 120 to 140 frames a second, there can be a bit there as well. I actually found it particularly obnoxious when I was playing games like Cyberpunk, which does have some quite demanding scenes which will drop the frame rate, or there'll be sudden fluctuations, and that can cause pretty obvious VRR flickering. You can also notice it in some in-game menu systems. It's basically where there's just large areas of flat shade, it tends to be most noticeable. I can see it here, for example, it looks like it's raining on the video. It's, some, it's not actually that, it's, it's actually flickering on the screen. And it's pretty much constant here because there are just slight fluctuations in the refresh rate. Well, I say slight, actually quite dramatic. You can see the refresh rate going all over the place. So it's not actually a huge range that it's changing in, but, it's, but it is fluctuating very rapidly here. So that will trigger the VRR flickering. There's also a VRR flickering test, which I like to use to really show this in a very obvious way. So you'll see the refresh rate is now going all over the place between double digits, triple digits really heavy fluctuations. In-game, generally, they won't be this heavy, although they can be in some scenes. So generally, it won't be this extent of VRR flickering. But honestly, in Cyberpunk, I did sometimes see it this intensely. But the this particular pattern makes it really obvious. It's quite flat. It's just a nice little gradient, I should say. And you can see it throughout the gradients. It's not like on OLEDs where it's just for the darker to medium shades. It's actually all of the shades. You can see it for the brighter shades as well. So if you're sensitive to this, sensitive to flickering in general, this can be a bit annoying and you might want to actually disable VRR for some games or just depending on your own sensitivity. I'd also like to briefly talk about NPRT, a strobe backlight setting which this monitor has. You can activate that, but you can't use it at the same time as adaptive sync. So there's no VRR at the same time. And you can use that at 100 Hertz and above. So I've got the monitor set to 120 Hertz using its fastest setting and 180 Hertz using its fastest setting and comparing that to MPRT enabled. When you have MPRT enabled, you can't adjust the brightness or the response time setting. And for the brightness, by the way, it sits close to 140 nits. So this is gonna be okay for some people, but not everyone, and you can't adjust that. The bigger issue I have with this is the amount of strobe crosstalk. So those fragmented trails around the UFO, sometimes in front of it, that's broadly termed strobe crosstalk. The monitor just isn't responsive enough to really make a good go of this kind of setting. It's actually difficult to see because of the amount of strobe crosstalk and it kind of blends this out a bit on this particular image. But there, there are also some issues with KSF phosphor fringing. So there's a bit of a magenta to red fringe behind the UFO. You might be able to see that. It's more obvious than the 180 hertz image. But you can actually see flashes to the eye if you're sensitive to this. I can notice these kind of rainbow flashes, as I like to call them, sometimes magenta, sometimes green, other colors, which I notice by eye. So you do notice flickering anyway with any strobe backlight setting. But where KSF phosphors are used, as they are in this case, you can notice these additional colorful flashes. So because of all of this, I just find the mode annoying and distracting, and I don't think it really does a good job at serving its main purpose of reducing perceived blur. Some people might find some utility in it, but personally I don't like the setting, and I don't think it's a particularly good strobe backlight setting. To wrap up then, I think for a budget ultrawide offering, which this is really, the build quality is pretty decent, the ergonomics pretty decent, and you get the 21 by 9 experience, you get the 1000 R curve, if you like that kind of thing. And being a VA panel, it does certainly put its main strength to use with strong contrast, close to the 3000 to 1 specified. You also get a fairly wide but not extreme colour gamut, so a bit of a dose of extra vibrancy. 
And as far as VA panels go, the colour consistency was quite decent, so it maintains that saturation fairly well throughout the screen. But I feel to an extent that's kind of where my praise of the monitor would have to end. So the HDR experience was extremely basic, and not just because it didn't have any local dimming, but it wasn't very well tuned. Gamma was all over the place, and actually the gamma under SDR was not perfect either. Not ideal, if you want things to look as they should. There were no settings in the OSD to change that. But under HDR, things were even worse in that respect, and things just looked generally washed out, and the gamut wasn't put to appropriate use. HDR really is more of a marketing feature on this monitor than it is anything else. It isn't even something which I think most people are going to want to use from time to time. I think in many respects it's just worse looking than SDR outright, so it's just not really a good addition. The responsiveness of the monitor, well in terms of the input lag it was quite good. It does support VRR, and that did work, but the pixel responsiveness was really pretty lacklustre, to be completely honest, even for a VA panel. It really wasn't very impressive at all. It includes a strobe backlight setting, which is pretty bad as well. VRR flickering is an issue when you're using VRR. For me, the response performance just wasn't where I'd like my monitors to be when I'm gaming, when I'm watching movies, or on the desktop. But sensitivity to these kind of issues which I'm talking about, they do vary, so this will be okay for some people. But it certainly isn't one that I would find myself recommending, based on the fact it is marketed as a gaming monitor. And even outside of gaming, I think there are some significant weaknesses to be aware of. I mean, it has been a while since I last reviewed a budget 34-inch ultrawide, with the last being the AOC CU34G2X back in 2020. This MSI doesn't exactly deliver a dramatically different experience, with, I'd argue, better build quality and improved refresh rate being the main draws, plus a steeper curve at 1000R rather than 1500R. The image quality and pixel responsiveness, it's pretty comparable between the two, and I'd give the AOC some points for being better calibrated, or at least offering an alternative gamma mode which was better calibrated. In terms of more recent alternatives, I've received a good amount of positive feedback on the Gigabyte G34WQCA, and this seems to be reflected by most user feedback on Amazon as well. It retails for a similar to slightly more expensive price than the MSI, although I haven't used it myself, so I can't say it's necessarily much better than the MSI. And I do know from similar Gigabyte designs that the stand is nowhere near as solid or premium feeling as the MSI's. And if you're really just interested in 34-inch ultrawides more generally, and you've got the budget, you could consider a QD OLED model, like the Philips Evnia 34M2C8600. Just rolls off the tongue, I know. It's one of the most affordable QD OLED ultrawides available, but offers a performance that's broadly similar to the AW3423DW I've reviewed, so you can expect exceptional vibrancy, contrast, and pixel responsiveness, but you need to be aware of burn-in potential for heavy productivity usage. I've personally used the Philips monitor, though not enough for a full review, and I've received a great deal of positive user feedback on it, so it's certainly one I can recommend. Retail links to the MSI plus these two alternatives are given in the video description, alongside additional content and information on how to support our work. Be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, they are nice ways of showing your support.